Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to M Cube's Thursday afternoon at the movies. Um, we have an Oscar quality movie today. <laughs> Twister Six, starring Lee Off. <laughs> Lee got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin um, back in 1997. Who was your advisor? John Anderson. John Anderson, working on the dynamics of microverse. Since then, he's been at a lot of institutions studying all sorts of aspects of severe convective storms and tornadoes. He went to University of North Carolina in Asheville for a few years, went to Central Michigan from 2003 to 2015. He was actually um, the chairman. The last three years. The last three I years he was chairman sure. there. Um, and in the, be in the meantime, perhaps one of his best and certainly what's really made him famous more than anything else is his interactions with Bob Wilhelmson um, in Illinois. Mm -hmm. at what's in the, that was, um, what was that called? The National Center for? Uh, NCSA, National yeah. Center for Supercomputing. Where he's really been a pioneer in, in visualizations of convective storms and tornadoes. Mm -hmm. um, he left Central Michigan in 2015 and is now back is that because you spent three years as chairman and you just couldn't, <laughs> just, I couldn't take it anymore? <laughs> yeah. And so he's now back doing science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and today he's going to talk about some real world-class visualizations. And the question is, what kind of science can come from this? I think yes. last week we saw not much from George, but... <laughs> Burn. <laughs> so, so go bar, ahead. The bar is set low is what you're saying? <laughs> no, 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 no. So anyway, thank you, Morris. <laughs> I saw some of your talk. Uh, I like the fact that you guys put these online. That's great, because these are, these are great talks. So thank you, Morris, and thank you all for coming. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge my collaborators on this. As Morris said, Robert Wilhelmson, uh, uh, Bruce Lee, and Adam Houston are both students of, uh, former students of Bob. Uh, Kathy Finley, I think she was a Cotton student. Um, I've assembled this team because I need people to help me understand, as Morris said, what's going on physically. And my expertise is primarily towards the numerical side, high performance computing. Um, and, and all these guys, uh, Bruce, Kathy, and Adam are both, they all, they go out and they do cha they chase, they, they take measurements, and they run models. So it's, that's sort of the rationale behind the team. So what I'd like to talk to you, a brief outline, what's motivating this work talk a bit about the process I went through. Most of the time I'm going to be talking about a, a specific simulation of um, a storm that occurred in, well, a, new, a, a modeled storm that is uh, patterned after or, or based after the 24 May 2011 El Reno supercell. We initialized the model with a ruck, forecast, uh, ruck sounding and let her go, and then I'll sort of close off there. So what's a supercell look like anyway? Um, here's a nice picture of a supercell, not maybe one that's been studied much, but I, I Brought it up here for a couple reasons. Um, here's a nice wedge tornado. Uh, you can see that in, in the, this is just a picture. You can see rain surrounding the tornado. You can see this sort of barrel-like uh, feature here. This is the mesocyclone, a giant rotating updraft. Um, and one of the reasons I, I, we are choosing this picture is this interesting feature here, this inflow cloud band that's along the forward flank of the storm. This is the rear flank of the storm, the forward flank. We're looking towards the west. Um, this feature suggests, at least, uh, potentially something that we're seeing in the numerical model, namely uh, this sort of helical sort of, uh, we call it a streamwise vorticity current that is, uh, is originally horizontally oriented vorticity that's then tilted into the vertical where it becomes part of the mesocyclone separate from the tornado. Um, but we're, we're looking for physical analogs to what we see in the model because these modeling studies are great, but on their own, they're not very useful if we can't find analogs in the real atmosphere. So we're trying to simulate at ultra high resolution. I don't know if we get better supercomputers. What goes after ultra, I don't know, but super duper mega high resolution. Uh, thunderstorms based on real events. So we're trying, the process we're taking here is taking some you know, GFS analysis or maybe ruck analysis or something and using that as the base state to initialize George's CM1 model. Um, and then to visualize the storms in ways that both elucidate storm scale and tornado scale features at very high temporal resolution. So we're talking on the order of one second, one second or less, so you have to save frames that often, save data. And then we want to, the scientific question we really want to answer is why do some storms produce these long track EF5s, so very powerful, very long lived tornadoes, 
whereas some storms don't even produce a, a tornado or produce a weak tornado. And then we want to uh, enable comparison to field studies, and maybe it's a bit presumptuous of me to say this, but maybe even some of this numerical, numerical work can help guide future field studies so we can go hunting for these features that show up in the model. Um, why do we study EF5s? Um, they are, well, devastating tornadic super, supercells. The large majority of fatalities associated with supercells occur in EF4 to EF5 strength uh, tornadoes and supercells. So in other words, um, there's a lot of tornadoes, supercells produce tornadoes pretty well, but most of them are weak and most of them don't do a whole lot of devastating damage. It's those upper end ones that are the least frequent but most damaging. Um, we still don't really know why some storms produce weak, strong, and no tornado. There's certainly been a lot of climatological studies looking at, you know, uh, photographs and, and capes and looking at things like that. We've made a lot of strides observationally with the Vortex programs. Um, until recently, we haven't had the computing technology to do this work, both the rendering or both the simulation and the rendering. And the Blue Water supercomputer was a huge help. That's where I ran these simulations. So how do you get this to work? What, what are all the pieces you need? You need a good model. CM1 is a good model. It's a great model, actually. We're using version 16. Um, we need a good set of initial conditions. In this case, we're looking at this 24 May, 11, uh, 24 May 2011 RUC forecast sounding that Lou Wicker gave me. It was uh, basically plucked out of there ad adjacent to the unobserved storm. So we're basically off the right flank of an observed supercell. We basically pull the environmental conditions and use that as the base state to grow a cloud in George's model. Um, I've done some work with the 31 May 13 storm. Uh, I never thought I'd get anything resulting, even resembling what happened. That was a, the, long, the widest tornado ever measured, 2.6 miles wide, that occurred in very much close to the same location that this guy did near El Reno, Oklahoma. Um, so, but I, if anyone wants to talk to me about that, I'll do it offline. And you need the hardware and software infrastructure. Uh, Blue Waters is one of the best computers for doing science. It's available to scientists. Yellowstone's another one. Cheyenne will probably be even better. Um, Blue Waters has about uh, a lot of processing cores, 26 petabytes of disk space, about 400 petabytes of nearline storage. I did a lot of work writing sort of code to glue things together. In other words, I had to find a way to get data out of CM1 to disk efficiently and then find ways to render it, and that's where I use these tools. Okay, so moving right along. Um, the size of the problem, just a few modelers. The, the storm I'm going to spend most of the time talking about is 1.8 billion, billion grid points, 2200 by 2200 by 380. That's big. Um, we have a 30 meter isotropic constant grid spacing intermesh in the inner uh, 60 by 60 by 10, bottom 10 kilometers. In the 20 meter simulation, it's 7.8 billion grid points. The same physical domain uh, in the stretch looks like that. So um, that's the size of the problem. It's, it's a big problem, and you need a big machine to do it. We configured CM1 using a fifth order convection, horizontal and vertical. Uh, Hugh Morrison, another NCAR guy, uh, his, his microphysics. The turbulence closure for the 30 meter simulation is Smagorinsky, um, and for the 20 meter it's TKE. We just happened to be using Smagorinsky at the time we got the tornado to form. I've tried a lot of different things before this simulation actually produced a tornado, different soundings, different settings. We use a free slip surface boundary condition, which is raised some eyebrows, um, but it, that's what we're using. Uh, we get very good looking tornadoes even with free slip, although there's gonna be some things that uh, are not gonna be correct, we think, and we're going to be doing a lot of work, proposed work to, uh, to add friction in, in, a, in a proper manner, as, as I think of it. Time step, one fifth of a second. For you climate modelers out there, imagine one fifth of a second time step, right? Um, for the 20 meter one, it's one eighth of a second. And we use the updraft a nudging technique of Naylor and Gilmore to get the storm going. So here's the sounding. I'll zoom in in a little bit, just to give you a brief overview of the storm. Uh, about 5,000 joules per kilogram of CAPE. Um, LCL about 528 meters. LFC is about 850 meters. Um, zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity, um, 371 meters squared per second squared. For those of you who aren't severe storm people, those are all off the chart numbers. Okay, there's, there's really um, no doubt that a supercell will form in this, in this environment. So I'll just kind of go up the sounding here so you can see it for those of you back in the room. Um, there's our parcel path, and there it is up, up to the top. Uh, here's our hodograph. Um, so here's the storm motion vector. Um, lots of low level shear. This is 0 0.5 kilometers above the ground, one kilometer, two kilometer, three kilometers. Lots of low level shear and deep, la deep layer shear. Those are both characteristics you want to see in supercells. 
So, okay, let's start talking about the simulation. Um, it takes on supercellular characteristics pretty quickly. By 26, 400 seconds, the storm has split into a right and a left mover. We can show that uh, using sort of a time history of, um, of, of maximum updraft velocity at five kilometers. This is one of the things that CM1 saves. So this is a 2400 seconds. You can see this is where the storm is initialized. Here, the right mover is starting to form. You're starting to see, this is the uh, 40 dBZ uh, isopleth. So you're starting to see uh, a weak echo region forming the beginnings of a hook. The left mover is sort of moving off. We don't really want that, so that's fine. You can go off into the mesh where we won't pay much attention to you into the outer boundaries. This is only a piece of the subdomain, by the way. The, the whole domain is, is 120 kilometers on a side. So by an hour into the simulation, you've got a very steady, strong updraft at five kilometers. Uh, now you've got a nice weak echo region, a very well-defined well -defined hook. So by 3,600 seconds, it's, it's a nice, powerful supercell. Uh, another view, sort of a plan view before we get into 3D stuff. So this is uh, surface wind vectors, storm relative. Uh, theta, um, excuse me, density potential temperature perturbation, which is proportional to buoyancy. So we can see how, how uh, negatively buoyant the cold pool is. And I'm also showing you the uh, 40 dBZ solid contour. So a couple of features to, to note, I've, I've put boundaries here. Severe storms meteorologists love to talk about boundaries. This is the rear flank downdraft gust front. This is the forward flank downdraft boundary. There's reasons why we don't call this a gust front. It's not much of a gust front when all the, basically, you can barely tell what the winds change here. Um, when this thing really kicks off, you see more of an actual gust front structure in the rear flank, which is typical. But one thing to, to notice is look at the convergence here under this massively strong updraft. I mean, anything you drop around this area near the ground is going to end up going up. Um, so even an hour into the simulation, it's showing that it's a very strong, uh, strong cell. So genesis occurs about an hour and 25 minutes in and dissipation th almost two hours later. So this is just sort of a sequence I like to show uh, what the storm looks like, a plan view. This is shortly after genesis. Here's our model domain. This is the cloud field. I'm not showing the precipitation. There is a little tiny tornado, and there's uh, you know, the wall cloud and the tail cloud. I like to show this kind of perspective because it gives you a real sense of the scale and realize that we have to actually resolve this tiny tornado with enough grid points, but we have to do that for the whole storm as well. Uh, we, the isotropic grid is in this region. Everything I'm going to show you is in that inner isotropic grid. So what does it look like over time? This is a, a couple minutes after Genesis. Shows a nice single cell tornado. That's a tornado where the, uh, the entire tornado is, is basically uh, within a, an updraft, um, as opposed to a two cell tornado where there's a strong downdraft in the center. This does transition into a two cell tornado. So this is just a cloud and rain field. This is that sort of that inflow band that I was trying to think of as an analogy from that photo from Roger Hill. This is rain. This is actually evidence of a, of a relatively weak anticyclonic tornado that is formed. It doesn't show the condensation funnel all the way to the ground. So just as just, this is from a paper I wrote. Uh, it's in parallel computing. It's about, it's about sort of the, a very short version of how I got this to work. It's mostly focused on the technology aspect. Um, notice that this is an interesting time in the model, in the storm's history. You see this very nice rain curtain that's sort of uh, enveloping the, uh, the wall cloud and the tornado. That's been seen in the field. As time goes on, you get some, some funny looking vortical sort of structures in the, in the wall cloud. Um, I know Howie Bluestein is here. I know he's not here here at the moment, but he, I showed him this picture and he says, you know, I've got some photographs that look very much like that. So this is important to us and me, you know, I want to be able to talk to people who look at real storms, and I want to make sure that this is reasonable. I know not everything is going to be perfect, it never is, but um, I'm convinced that what's going on here is, is worth, uh, is pretty good. So you can see how the tornado basically gets wider over time, it, it becomes a two cell tornado, and eventually it gets wrapped in rain, it goes through all sorts of, all sorts of changes. So one thing that you notice, uh, and I'll show this in the animations, are you get a lot of these little mesocyclones and mesoanticyclones forming along the forward flank downdraft boundary. And this looks like a, we're calling it a vertical vort vortex sheet. Um, although it's a vertical vortex sheet that has some anticyclonic uh, vortices in it, so it's not a pure horizontal shear instability, but it does favor cyclonic vortices. So this is shortly following uh, uh, Genesis. What I'm showing you here is the vertical vorticity, I'm sorry, the, the um, three-dimensional vorticity field, volume rendered, 
I'm coloring it by the magnitude of the vertical vorticity. What that means is when you see red guys, they're cyclonic. When you see blue guys, they're anticyclonic. But you're seeing the full three-dimensional vorticity field. So that lets us see everything, including horizontal vorticity. So here are these cyclonic vort vortices along the forward flank downdraft. These guys are coming right into the tornado. This is the rear flank uh, downdraft region over here. Um, and you'll see, I don't show it too much here, but you'll see there's a lot of interesting things going on in the vicinity of a tornado. Um, anticyclonic, cyclonic, cyclonic. Um, lots of vorticity being fed into the tornado. The, the, the cyclonic vortices merge the tornado. The anticyclonic vortices get wrapped around the tornado and end up getting it vected vertically upwards. And this is one of those events that occurs. It's getting all twisted out of shape as it gets, as it gets uh, drawn upward by the strong updraft. A feature we call a streamwise vorticity current uh, feeds this vorticity into the mesocyclone and is associated with the, uh, the vortices. So this is a vapor image. Um, so this is the vertical vorticity sheet region. These are all these vortices. You can't tell the, the anticyclonic from cyclonic in this figure. This arrow points to what's going to become the tornado. This region here, which we feel we haven't done any quantitative analysis, not much quantitative analysis, but it's, it's certainly consistent. The SVC is consistent with uh, baroclinically generated horizontal vorticity that occurs along and behind the forward flank of the storm. The updraft is very strong, and it pulls this up and pulls it into the updraft, whereby tilting it becomes vertical vorticity. Um, so this is sort of what it looks like, and here's our anticyclonic uh, tornado, and there's an actually one wrapped around it. You see a lot of these vortices wrapping around the tornado. It's really cool. Um, we, I see something that I'm calling a a streamwise vorticity sheet that's very, um, very close to the ground. It's within the cold pool. I, I'm really interested in, in what is causing this. And um, so now I'm going to step through genesis, maintenance, and decay. I've just sort of given you an overview. So severe storm meteorologists are very interested in tornado genesis. What is the formation of tornadoes? What leads them? What causes them to form? Because obviously, if we can capture features in the environment that pre precede this formation, that might give us. Uh, better warnings, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing you see occurring in this simulation is what I'm calling a, a streamwise vorticity sheet that occurs near the ground. I'll zoom, on in this in a, zoom in on this in a second. I just want to define everything. So this is shortly following Genesis. The black vectors are surface wind vectors, storm relative. The yellow vectors are horizontal vorticity vectors. OK, I'm just calcul I just take that out of CM1. And I'm showing you the uh, potential uh, density, potential temperature perturbation. And then the solid contours show the updraft. So let me zoom in so you can see what's going on. And I'll stop right about here. So right here is our young tornado. This, um, I'll talk about the streamlined vorticity in a second. Here is the forward flank downdraft boundary, the rear flank downdraft gust front. And yes, I know we're full of, I know I'm not supposed to use acronyms, but we use a lot of these. This is the rear flank downdraft internal surge boundary. Now, I know, I know. It's in the literature, OK? I, I can stand behind that. But why, do we, what, why are we studying these? So in the rear flank of, of supercells, observations and modeling studies have shown that it's not like there's just one steady downdraft that keeps going. It's very, very transient, lots of transient downbursts. And the downdrafts will cause these little boundaries, and you see these surges. Now, why are we interested in this? Theoretically, this could trigger a tornado via the stretching of vorticity or the convergence near the ground. So these surges, sometimes you'll see, you'll see evidence of a surge preceding uh, tornado genesis. I don't think we're seeing that in this simulation. I haven't, I'm not suggesting any, cause, uh, any sort of uh, causality there. But this is what I find interesting. So this is, the cold, this is the cold pool. And look at how wonderfully the yellow and black arrows are aligned. This is streamwise vorticity, but it's streamwise vorticity along a very large region within the cold pool, not just along the, uh, the boundary here. So, and I've traced parcels. When you drop parcels near the ground, they all end up going straight into the tornado. So it appears that the tornado is, some of the vorticity from the tornado is, is, is originating at least from, um, from near the ground. So, I actually calculated the streamwise vorticity, at least how I calculate it. I use the storm relative velocity dot product with the vorticity vector, and then I divide by the magnitude of the storm relative winds. That will give you the component of the vorticity vector that is aligned with the velocity vector. So it's the component of the, so it's a streamwise vorticity. Um, and then I just volume render it. So I'm looking right down the forward flank downdraft boundary, and the tornado is going to form right about here. So let me let this run. Um, so I'm calling this, this white isosurface is pressure deficit. 
Um, this is, I guess, what I'm calling a streamwise vorticity sheet. This thing is what I'm, we're calling the streamwise vorticity current. Here's another view of the same thing that shows it a little clearer. And you see, I'll show this some more, but you see a real strong convergence of cyclonic vortices occurring here in concert with the strengthening of this. And then that streamwise vorticity sheet sort of aligns itself up. And there is the beginning of our tornado in the pressure field. So that looks interesting. Um, it's certainly, I don't want to suggest that I've discovered something completely unknown about the fact that baroclinically generated horizontal vorticity leads to rotation when it's tilted. I'm not suggesting that that's a new idea, but we're seeing structure now that I think hasn't been seen in lower resolution simulations, at least with this kind of fidelity. So uh, the SVC strengthens along the FF, the forward flank downdraft boundary. It's tilted and it provides vorticity into the mesocyclone. So here's the same field showing uh, uh, at 5,100 seconds. I'll zoom in again, and I, I want to make it clear that this SVC thing, whatever you want to call it, this sort of helical flow that goes along here, is not, it's, it's decoupled from the tornado. It's not going straight into the tornado. It's going to the mesocyclone around the tornado. I, and again, before we, until we do budgets and stuff, it's not going to be clear as to what its importance is, but it does seem to be uh, feeding that meso with lots of, lots of vertical vorticity as it's tilted, and, um, and it's very, very much streamwise vorticity. Uh, the tornado forms from one of many cyclonic vortices that originates near the ground. Um, so, again, theories of tornado formation. The tornado basically forms almost simultaneously along its length. Uh, certainly nothing like the dynamic pipe effect where it takes time and descends from the above. Um, so, it, and this is consistent with some observational uh, results from Hauser et al., uh, uh, Jana Hauser, one of Howie Blue Science former students, uh, who went out and, and saw that with the actual uh, 24 May storm. Now, so this is Genesis. So this tornado, right, this is going to be the tornado. Here's our anticyclonic guy. Now I'm this just doing zeta. So this is a, a blue uh, anticyclone. These are all cyclonic. Notice how this, this region here along this, what we're calling the vertical vorticity sheet, are certainly favoring cyclonic vortices, but there are some anticyclonic ones that get in there. So I'll let this go, and it's a tornado. Here, here's our updraft. I forget what isosurface I use. So let me go back and show that again, going back a little further in time. So. There's a lot of small scale stuff going on, but you know I think it's piece of the it's a piece of the prop, uh, of the puzzle. There's also a strengthening of the SVC, a strengthening of the updraft. Lots of things are going on, and causality has not yet been established. Here is me just dropping parcels at near the ground every two seconds, letting them go. I'm coloring them by the wind speed, so I'm just letting parcels go. And this is during Genesis. You see the. Uh, SVC is behind, and here's the tornado forming, here's the anticyclone, here's the forward flank gust front, here's the rear flank boundary. Um, so here I'm going to go through some slides. This is from a paper I just submitted to BAMS. Um, we're, we're stepping through, looking at Genesis. Again, this is vorticity magnitude colored by the vertical components. So here's our blue guys, anticyclonic rotation, and our red, red and yellow, which is cyclonic. Um, and I just kind of look, you know, little guy here, we just kind of follow it through, the, through time. We see that there's a lot of consolidation of vorticity here. It, this is sort of a piece of the SVC right there. Here's another 20 or 40 seconds later. And here we see this uh, vorticity is getting stronger. Here's an anticyclonic vortex that just happens to be hanging out. I don't know. It, I think it sweeps around and gets evicted upwards. Now you're starting to see uh, more vorticity, a whole line of these things. Some of these are anticyclonic. And at some point, we just declared a tornado. I mean, it, it takes, I haven't actually, you know, figured out when does it finally break the EF zero range, but it definitely becomes a tornado. And, and that's what we're seeing at low levels. I, I'm not here to suggest that low levels are the only thing that's important either. Uh, here's just to give you some sense of scale. The tornado condensation funnel is about 400 meters deep here. Here's the wall cloud, another 200 meters. The base of the cloud here is roughly at the LCL. And this tail cloud that feeds in is actually, uh, the cloud base is, is a bit lower. So I'm going to let this go. This is just an animation run 60 times real time. Some of these animations are crazy. Tornadoes move fast enough. You don't have to speed them up. But if you want to see the storm scale structure, you do have to do that. So there's our condensation funnel. It descends to the ground. A lot of the, what's that? It's descending, it's descending but the, the condensation funnel is descending. But that vortex is anchored in place. And I'll show that in a second. Um, you see a lot of structure in this inflow band this, that is suggestive of these vertical vortices. Um, and it is, you'll see this in the vorticity field. Lots of transient downbursts here in the rear flank. Some of these downbursts produce positively buoyant air at the surface. I haven't looked too closely at this yet, but it's very low theta E air um, and it's positively buoyant and even though it's associated with rainy downdrafts. So that's an interesting, interesting result. 
tornado gets wider. It, you know, we're seeing some aliasing effects here because I'm going so fast. You see some horizontal rolls that go up along the tornado, um, and it just kind of churns along for a long time. It eventually gets wrapped in rain, more storm chaser lingo, but that's actually a real dangerous issue if you're trying to chase a storm and you can't see it. What, is, what were the magnitude of the winds being produced? In the, in the tornado? tornado pr the maximum wind's 143 meters per second at storm relative. The ma that's the maximum instantaneous, but the more steady state winds are about 120 meters per second storm relative. It's more when you do ground relative. Now we have free slip surface boundary conditions, which is probably making that number higher than it should be. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a high end EF5. So here I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna color vorticity magnitude by the vertical component, looking at larger values. So I'm clipping off the opacity curve at 0.25. You're not gonna see any vorticity with values lower than that. Here's the anticyclonic one, the cyclonic, just to sort of get, your, get yourself oriented, and here's the cold pool that's in the buoyancy field. So to address your point, Morris, there is, uh, I haven't actually showed this, this vortex form, but it basically forms just almost instantaneously, uh, pretty much from the ground up, but just basically right here. Um, so there is, it's descending, but look, that sucker's there. It's been there for a while. And that's, I think, important, and it's not surprising. I mean, the condensation funnel is a function of, of the environmental conditions and such. You're not always going to see a condensation funnel when there's a tornado. Um, you know, you're going to see, I'll show more of this too, but you're going to see a lot of these vortices coming here. This, when you see red here in the cold pool, that's positively buoyant, and this is the, this is the buoyancy field. Um, so if you're feeding an updraft with positively buoyant air, it's easier to lift, certainly, than if it's negatively buoyant. Um, the cold pool undergoes these oscillations um, or in, its, in how cold it is. It gets less cold, it gets colder, it gets warm. There's a lot of variation. Um, this sort of, you're starting to see the two-celled structure of a tornado form. Um, the 20 meter simulation shows this a bit better. Um, here's, now I was a little nervous when I st first started looking at this simulation because of this, this anticyclonic tornado. I thought, oh, these guys are really rare and I'm getting anticyclonic tornadoes. This is bad, this is bad. No one's gonna ever look at this work. Well, anyone actually be at, was anyone on this storm? Anyone from in the room see this storm? I oh, yeah, okay, good for you. <laughs> but yeah, oh, okay. This is a beautifully photogenic storm. I mean, it was just beautiful. And it has an anticyclonic tornado and a, a nice wedge looking tornado surrounded by rain. Looks reasonable uh, compared to what we're seeing. Um, this is not Photoshop. This is actually a real picture. Um, it's, this is an anticyclonic tornado and it's, it's just gorgeous. Um, I just love that. Okay, so let me talk about the streamlined vorticity current because we think it's I think we think it's a pretty important component of what makes this storm uh, so long lived and strong. And again, we don't know the link between the SVC and the tornado, but I think it's a part of the puzzle. So this is an inset image to a larger image I'm going to show in a second. So the camera eye in the next image is going to be coming from the northwest, going to be looking in that direction. So here's a tornado. Here's this SVC sort of superimposed two-dimensionally onto the surface. It's not that smooth. Everything's tilted. Here's the hook echo, the hook echo region of the storm, just so you can get your bearings. This looks something like a low reflectivity ribbon. If you see those in the literature, I don't know if that is important or not, but I would call it that. So here is uh, another vapor image looking southeast. So I'm just dropping parcels right here along that forward flank downdraft boundary and letting them go every two seconds. Just letting them go, letting them go, letting them go and following the air. So you're seeing parcels that have, you know, that were let go a long time, but this is, this is not steady state. This is, this is actual advection, just letting the parcels go. And here is uh, the rear flank of the storm, the forward flank, and here's the tornado. So you look at this, looks like a kind of a coherent structure. It, it mean, the air parcels stay together. I mean, it looks like a thing, you know, you, when you call, when you introduce a new term into the lexicon, of course, you're always nervous that you, you shouldn't do that, but, um, anyway, so here's what the SVC looks like in three dimensions. Just you know, nothing is vertically oriented perfectly. Everything's tilted. Even the tornado is tilted, but it just sort of gives you a sense of, of its relationship to the tornado and how it kind of wraps around the tornado, but it never actually feeds the tornado directly. Uh, maybe the tornado is cyclone aloft. This next, so we're doing the maintenance phase of the tornado now. This was uh, an animation done by David Bach at NCSA. Um, he used his own custom-based render to, to render the storm. This is a nice way to show the mesh that we use, at least a representation of the mesh, where the, and George showed a picture of just like this at his talk last time, um, where you've got your inner, inner mesh and your outer stretch mesh, and we just basically keep everything that's important in, in that region. Uh, the storm does go a little bit to the south. Uh, we do adjust the box speed once in the simulation, but we keep all the important stuff in that inner mesh. Uh, so David has done a very interesting thing with the volume rendering. Uh, he, he, the cloud is kind of semi-opaque, 
Um, he uses shadowing and all sorts of cool things. Um, I like this. I stopped his animation here just to show how cool it is. There's the overshooting top. You know, if you're flying a plane through the anvil looking down, you can see the mesocyclone uh, laminar structure here. There's that other one. Yeah, it's so cool. Um, and now I'm just going to let it go. Um, and this, is, this animation really shows the structure here better than the tornado, but tornado is kind of a, a secondary uh, feature in this animation. Um, but, I mean, you see things, again, this is 30 times real time, so it's, it's sped up, like your fingers on the fast forward button. But this type of, this looks pretty realistic. Would you agree, Morris? Think it looks like a supercell? It looks like a supercell. I mean, it looks good. Um, you're seeing some Mematis type clouds looking, uh, structures that look consistent with Mematis, although they're not down anvil, but anyway, so it looks really good. Here is um, an animation of vorticity magnitude, again, I'm using a pretty low threshold here, so you're seeing more vorticity than before, and this is what we're calling the SVC. So this is the feature that we, we we're focusing on. Here's the tornado that's been uh, on the ground for quite a while at this point. What you'll notice in this sequence is the SVC, as evidenced in the vorticity field, there's a lot of vorticity going on. Um, sometimes it's sort of the, the upward branch of the SVC is very close to the up, down updraft, and sometimes it isn't. And then sometimes the vorticity, the SVC gets weaker. I'm pretty sure there's still the same basic flow feature there, it's just at smaller values. And then later on, it all picks up again. So suddenly you start to see more vorticity, you're starting to see the, vor the, the vertical vortices going, but, but look at that. I mean, it's, a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a thousand pictures, so I don't know, it's a lot of words. But there's a lot go <laughs> going on. And this is probably my, one of my favorite ever. Uh, again, this is using vapor, dropping parcels every two seconds along that boundary. Here's our tornado doing its thing, and there's the SVC. You can see evidence of those little vortices there. Um, but it's all, it's really cool. Uh, the, the, the vapor's doing a very good job of calculating the trajectories because the trajectories in the vorticity field, he's calculating the trajectories outside, just using the model variables, and it's, it's following the flow field just beautifully. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even know that they were from two different, you know, being calculated. Um, CM1 can also do trajectories. We haven't been doing those yet. So that, you know, that's, we're looking at that thing. Is that a thing that's important? We think it probably is. So again, I'll step through this. Um, just a few dis different snapshots through time. Same thing, vortice vorticity magnitude colored by zeta. Here's our tornado. This is at 5470, so it's been on the ground for 15 minutes or so. Blue, red, red, blue, red. So here's, here's our vertical vorticity sheet, although it has some uh, anticyclonic vortices in it. And here's the SVC behind it coming up around. And this sort of regime is maintained for very long. Couple hundred seconds later, more anticyclones in there. Um, this is the time where the strongest surface wind is in the model. 143 meters per second, right here along the interface of the tornado in an anticyclonic vortex that is being swept around the tornado's periphery. And there's just sort of right along, it's like two gears turning. You've got the, uh, the vortex relative flow here superimposed by the translation velocity of that anticyclone. And then This is the inflow, yes. So this is that SVC. This is where those particles are going up and, up and around. Um, and that, that was at the strongest winds in the model. It happened at this time. Um, and much later into the simulation, this is like a half hour later, kind of the same basic regime. You'll notice this is when the SVC has gotten a little bit less, uh, you know, the vorticity is a little lower in there. Um, the RFD is kicking out more turbulence at this point. You'll see a lot of the a lot of stuff that comes out of the RFD is just a, a vort vorticity spaghetti. I mean, it's it's not very organized. It's turbulent. You're just as likely to have anticyclonic vortices as cyclonic. And um, but it really seems like the ones along the forward flank are the more more uh, important ones. So again, here is it at the at the strongest velocity. I'm now choosing a larger vorticity threshold so you can see more of the of the of the higher vorticity regions. The center, I'm gonna zoom in in a second. This is uh, showing the downdraft in the center of a tornado to show that it's two-celled. Two this is pressure deficit, um, showing you the negative pressure associated with the tornado and other things. So um, I guess I'll just say, I'll go up the whole tornado, but uh, you know, it's a two-celled tornado and this lobe of low pressure is associated with the SVC. So thinking in terms of you know, decomposing the pressure and all that stuff, there's all sorts of cool things we can do to look at the influence of this and what is driving that pressure drop. It, is it cyclostrophically driven by the rotation in the SVC? I don't know. 
Um, the tornado, you can see evidence of the tornado all the, almost all the way up to the top of the model, 20 kilometers. Now, when I say evidence, I mean you can sort of follow the vorticity field and still sort of see the tornado. But you'll notice the pressure deficit isn't as, isn't as large once you get above 10 kilometers. So, and I haven't spent a lot of time looking at what's going on aloft. Most of what I've been looking at has been the bottom, say, 10 kilometers or so. So I'm going to re release some more parcels. Uh, again, this is using vapor. This is get our orientation here looking south. Here's the forward flank downdraft boundary. So these parcels that are only like 100 meters deep here are just like a layer of them, letting them go, the red ones. These dark green ones are in the, uh, in the forward flank of the storm. The yellow ones are sort of in between the forward and rear, and these are in the rear flank. Um, so you can kind of, you know, where is the air coming from and where is it going? It really seems like most of the air in the center of the tornado, not the center of a tornado, not where the descending air is, it originates from the cold pool. There's, I don't really see evidence of much air getting into the tornado from the warm side. You can see evidence of that surface streamwise vorticity sheet just by looking at how these parcels at different levels are going in different directions, right? It's almost like you have a stack of paper and you can kind of rotate it. And that's, that is the, you're seeing that, uh, that vorticity in, in, in the field there. And those guys are going straight into the tornado. This is more SVC air. And over here, it's just, you know, other, whatever, it is what it is. I mean, we're just trying to kind of figure out where things are going. What's the vertical scale of the back of those parcels? About 100 meters. It's very, very, I'm trying to look at what's going on near the ground. Um, so it's only like 100 meters or so deep. And you can see how this air seems to be in the center air as you go forward. Rearward in the storm is more further out, and some of the RFD air is even further out. Again, I, you know, this, there's a lot of things to look at. And, and this is, you know, my main goal at this point is just to show the storm, show this stuff, and kind of decide what's important and how we're going to pick this apart to, uh, to do more scientific studies. Here I just release parcels aloft at a couple of kilometers and just let them go. And this is to show the two-celled structure. It's really cool. I mean, they really, parcels really do get trapped in the tornado and they, they go down and they get whew, slurped back up again. I'm coloring these by the vertical motion. So blue ones are going down, red ones are going up. This is a long sequence. This is just the vorticity at the surface, vertical vorticity, zeta, over time. And here's your forward flank, here's your rear flank, here's your anticyclonic tornado, here's your big tornado. And just look, so we see, two th we see a couple things. We see all this consolidation along the forward flank downdraft boundary, but there's plenty of vorticity occurring within the cold pool as well. Um, I've heard terms of rivers of vorticity, so maybe these are vortic vorticity rivers or whatever, where you see these long linear segments of, of vertical vorticity. I don't know. I don't know what they are. Um, but this tornado doesn't seem to care what you throw at it. Uh, sometimes you'll see a huge con contribution from the rear flank, lots of unsteady downdrafts here as an example. Things get really sort of calm over here in the forward flank for a while. You sort of see these linear segments. Um, and then uh, you'll watch this region get all turbulent and this region calm down. So there could be some like long period things going on and there's an anticyclone that gets really, that's really cool when you see it in 3D. It just gets completely wrapped or it goes, takes a couple cycles around the tornado and gets slurped up. Um, but there's a lot of, there could be some like long period things going on within the storm um, that are causing these different sort of regimes in the forward rear flank, I don't know. But it, it goes and goes. I mean, I could show these movies forever. Um, okay, we, all good things must come to an end. So the tornado does dissipate. It was funny when I um, originally ran the simulation, um, I got all excited and I started analyzing it. I never let it die. It, the, the data sat on disk for like six months before I let the tornado actually die, so it was like in, in limbo. But anyway, it does dissipate. It actually dissipates in a really interesting way. Um, if you chase storms, you often see uh, tornadoes go into the rope phase where the, the gust front tends to undercut the tornado and it gets kind of pulled sideways like the Wizard of Oz or whatever, and then it ropes out, as they say. That doesn't happen here. This tornado pretty much dies along its length like it was born along its length rather quickly. We think this is linked to uh, a destruction of the streamized vorticity current and pretty much a destruction of the near surface streamized vorticity sheet. Essentially, the cold pool gets warm. That's one thing that happens. And your, your buoyancy gradients are not going to support the kind of flow we had before that. Um, so let me show the death of this tornado. This is just vorticity, and this is volume rendered rain. And on the ground, blue is negatively buoyant, and, and warm colors are positively buoyant. So we see that the, the tornado is just you know, engulfed in rain. You see evidence of a pretty strong downdraft. And, and in fact, this does sort of form like a little, a little downburst as it dies. And it's just gone. And 
when you look at the SVC and the SVS, they are proceeded to weaken and basically go away in concert with this. Again, I don't want to suggest causality because we haven't looked at it close enough yet. You, you, the, the, simulate, the animation suggests that it's the, down, it's the rainy downdraft that killed the tornado, but I, we don't know. We haven't looked at it close enough yet. Here's the model grid, actually. You're seeing all the vectors. So it looks like a tornado. It looks like a tornado. It's nice cyclonic, and then boom. And then it's gone, and this is a warm downdraft, probably from adiabatic compression. I don't know, but, and boof, she's gone. It really dies in like 30 seconds. And there has been observational evidence of tornadoes that have died like that, but it's not the most common mode, I think, of tornado death. Uh, here's just looking along the tornado vortex, the vorticity field. This is just an isosurface surface of, of vertical vorticity. The vortex gets all messed up along its length, and it, you know, there's, there must be some kind of communication along its length, and it just, it just fizzles out and dies. You can see how quickly the, the rotational flow here, and this is, by the way, of um, uh, reflectivity. Uh, it just kind of it just kind of dies, and no more tornado. And I ran the model for like another 15 minutes, and no more tornado. Okay, so for the remainder of this talk, I'm pretty much going to show you very preliminary results from the same exact environment, same same model initialization, except we're now using the TKE scheme instead of Smagorinsky again. It's I don't want to ascribe too much importance to that, but I want to at least mention it. Uh, we get a similar Supercell produces a long track EF5. It also produces a weaker anticyclonic tornado that actually does show up in the condensation uh, in the cloud field. And you get a much more realistic looking multiple vortex structure of the EF5. So this is, the rest of this is just video. Here's, this is just the anticyclonic tornado. And then it goes, and this is 30 times real time, boom, there's our, there's our tornado. This is just the cloud and rain field. And, um, so again, you have to sort of calibrate your brain. This is 30 times faster than it would be if you were watching it. I'm going to zoom in here and show you what's going on much slower later. But I think this looks a even better than the 20 meter simulation, at least in terms of how the cloud field looks like, the structure of the tornado itself. You really see multiple vortex action going on there. Um, it gets rain wrapped. It, it does a lot of similar things. I have not looked for the SVC in this simulation yet. I have not looked for all the features we've identified. At this simulation, I, like literally a couple weeks ago, I've really only started to look at it. Um, but I'm encouraged by the fact that as we get to higher resolution, we start to see uh, the things that we would expect to see. And I, George showed me some of his uh, work he's doing uh, with tornadoes and another researcher here uh, using like a, a Fiedler chamber. Um, showing things that look, I see some things that look similar, maybe not as well resolved. I know you're running at much higher resolution, but I see some very reasonable looking things here. When I talk to observational meteorologists, they say that it looks reasonable. So I, I, I think we're not just playing in model world here. I think there's some good science to be done by looking at this. Um, you know, these guys, you can see there's, there's multiple vortices. You can see peek through, peek through the cloud field and see right through it. Clearly there's no debris in this model. Um, and uh, I'm not, I'm rendering, um, what else am I, oh, there's no debris, so you're not going to see that because <laughs> it's not there. That would be a fun thing to do. Um, in, a, in a minute, actually, David Llewellyn's done it, so it can be done. Put a debris model in here. Um, this is from the April 9th, 2015 Fairdale. This poor guy got stuck on the side of the road, didn't know what the hell he was doing, and this big tornado. So I show this, this is in real time, this is six times faster or seven times. But I show this just to kind of compare. I mean, if you look closely here, you'll see brief moments where you can peek through this. Uh, there, is, there is one, there's one. You can see that this is a multiple vortex. When you look at the, the ground scouring that occurred from this tornado, you see nice uh, cycloidal things. And you know, you see some things here, but look, yeah, he's lucky to be alive. Um, <laughs> And it goes on and on and on. So I think we're on to something good. OK, so the rest of this is vorticity. Here is, I use a threshold, of a small threshold, so you can see what's going on. Um, looking towards the north, here's our anticyclonic tornado. And you're going to see little cyclonic guys. Let's go around, merry-go-round here. Here's your forward flank the downdraft boundary. Now, this is different than, the other, than our 30-meter simulation. The tornado forms right, you're going to start to see, all of a sudden, you're going to start to see a lot more yellow and reds. And yellows and reds are uh, positive vertical vorticity. OK, so you're going to, and I was talking to George about this. It's as if the, the updraft just goes crazy and starts stretching everything it can find. Because you sort of see these vortices just kind of growing out of the ground. And here's our, our nascent tornado. And here is, you know, you're starting to see some convergence going on. Um, and then it's like showtime. Uh, 
This thing starts out as a, a pretty narrow single cell tornado and you'll start to see evidence of vortex breakdown occurring aloft. Um, you'll, this thing will turn into a, a two-celled structure. Here's some of those, those, those linear features in the density field or potential temperature, density potential temperature field. Um, and I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do in a bit is I'm gonna put two identical uh, renderings of the tornado but use different thresholds. So you'll be able to see the internal tornado structure better. I like this choice of, of threshold because I see a lot of the weaker vorticity because I want to see what's going where. Vorticity actually makes a halfway decent tracer at, at, in, in, some, in some ways. So now you can see it's, a, it's got two, two intertwined vortices going round and round, churning away. Um, we've got surface winds that are 140, 150 meters per second. They're probably, probably a little faster than they should be. Again, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to measure near the ground um, in, in reality. Now you're starting to see what looks like the forward flank downdraft boundary is kind of off to the left a little bit before it was off to the right, and, and this is feeding the storm a little bit. So the structure of the tornado and the storm structure looks a little different than the 20, 30 meter simulation, but that really shouldn't surprise us because of how sensitive these, these model runs are to initial conditions, to parameters, and everything else. Uh, but it really gets, now it's starting to look, you know, it's gotten much wider. This is where it's in its multiple vortex stage. You can see uh, multiple vortices. Uh, you can see some really interesting horizontal vortices kind of go around, and, and it's, it's, it's really pretty kind of neat. Um, and then what, the tornado doesn't quite die immediately. When it starts to shed vorticity, you just see, I think this is when you see a, a lot of rain falling. It doesn't quite die all the way, but it does get fizzled out quite a bit. Uh, here's the same sequence, same threshold, but looking at it as if you were standing on the ground. So if you were standing on the ground and the scale here, this is one kilometer, two kilometers. So this is like one, two, three, four kilometers or so. All of a sudden, this may be an RSVC showing up in the vorticity field. I don't know yet. This is the lucky vortex. It's going to start accumulating lots of vorticity. Some of it's coming in from here. Some of it must be being driven from aloft. I mean, this isn't just what's going on at the surface. Um, there is our vortex breakdown. Um, it's still a single cell. Now it's, it's transitioning to, to a two cell tornado. It will eventually come all the way to the ground. Um, so this is going to be a lot of fun, I think, um, looking at this. I think um, we need to sort of define how we're going to break this into pieces because it's one thing to, to get a great simulation, but it's another thing to actually do real science. And I'm, we're very aware of that. We're, we're looking at this from the context of, of observations and theory. Um, but first, being able to do this is, is, is valuable. Um, and doing this first sort of gives us a, a story that we can, we can tell, at least see, we can figure out if it's right or not. But yeah, now it's looking real good. Um, and th this is my last sequence. So I'm showing the same sequence I just showed, but this one I've put the threshold a, bu a bit higher. And this will show the internal structure of the tornado near the ground uh, much better. You'll start to see the, uh, uh, the, the intertwined vortices a little clearer. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know, this anticyclonic tornadoes, they're interesting, they're rare, they happen. Um, I wonder what's forcing that. This one seems to be, it's like connected. You see a little bit of two-cell action even up here aloft. Um, and now here we, here we go. So now, notice how I said it grew out, grew out of the ground. You notice how it sort of started at the bottom and came up. So here's our, uh, you're not seeing any vorticity less than 1.5 inverse seconds. Um, and I'll just let her, let her rip. If you have any questions, just go ahead and shout them out. So what do you think, Rich? Look good? Yeah. Does it look good? <laughs> so yeah, it's doing, I think, a reasonable, it's doing the right things. Again, you can get tornadoes with a free slip surface boundary condition. It's been done before. But there's some things we need to look at. And um, again, I'm a little nervous about getting too excited until we sort of um, address certain issues. I think from a storm structure scale, though, I think there's a lot of interesting things you can do and that, that are valuable in this. And now you're starting to see it very much into, into the two. And now you're going to see some of those multiple vortices. This thing sort of like changes directions on you. It's like the, can you tell which way it's rotating? It's like ah, all over the place. Um, and then it, it goes on. It, what interesting, so you'll see that this, the field here in, in the lower threshold, it's going to get wider and bigger. And you're going to start to see this just kind of go away. Um, as, as the tornado gets wider and wider. Of course, you really want to look at circulation more than vorticity, but that's a little more difficult to calculate. Um, but here we go, um, and you can see how the, uh, the, the vortic vorticity threshold is a little lower, but it's still, it, it's a tornado, there's no doubt about it. 
Um, and here's a couple of those anticyclonic guys that get sort of drawn around the tornado and then swept upward. I doubt they have any real strong importance, but they sure are cool looking. I just love that. When you're, you know, you're resolving things well enough that these vortices can be actually uh, uh, resolved pretty well and you're seeing this, this cool interaction. And here's where things get all downdrafty and I don't know what happens after that. So let me sort of conclude um, my parting thoughts. I don't have any like real solid scientific results yet on this. My parting thoughts are, you know, this can be done now. This is something that um, computational resources sort of hindered us for a while, but it's more than just that. We have the hardware now, we have the software, and we have observations. And the observations, I'm sort of using the, the, the RUC model and stuff as a proxy for observations because it's assimilated data or analysis data, but it's all, to, it's all there. Um, these features I've, we've identified, such as the streamlined vorticity current, the vertical vortex sheet, the parade of vortices that goes along the forward flank, um, the rear, I'm sorry, yeah, the forward flank. Um, they're intriguing, but do they exist in nature? I know that there have been observations of these small scale vortices preceding tornado genesis. I know Howie Bluestein has a couple papers on that. Some of the high resolution uh, data, uh, the, the, the radar observations from uh, Josh Worman su support this. Uh, when you looked at the 31 May 13 storm, they were vortices and vortices and is a complete mess. So this isn't something that's too surprising. The SVC is, is something that's intriguing. I think it, I'm trying to think of how you'd find it on radar. You know, I'm trying to think of if these things exist, how do we go find them? Um, the morphology of a tornado is very interesting when you get down to 20 meters. It, it's doing, I think, a reasonable thing. Um, so the question is now, you know, where's the science? And that's why, mostly, why I went to UW to, so I could spend all my time doing this. I'm a, since it's, I'm a, a, now I'm 100% researcher. And, um, and that's where we're at. So, We've got a BAMS paper that's in review, second round of reviews. It looks, it was very favorably reviewed. We think it will probably be published. I don't know how long it takes at this point, but hopefully you'll be able to read about it. And I will now say, do you have any questions for me? And by the way, I do put all my talks online. I know you guys do too, but I, I also put mine online. You can see more things and more animations at my website. So thank you very much. Make a quick comment before we go to questions. Sure. As regards the, the SVC and the you know, this um, streamwise vorticity current and its relationship to the tornado, I think Fujita identified that way way back in the Fargo tornado, where he shows the tornado as off to the side of the main rotating oh. draft current. So I think that's a very very common Good. Uh, observation okay. that. Um, you know, it goes back, well, it's not surprising it goes back to Fujita, but... Absolutely, uh, He's, yeah. he was way ahead of his time. Right, so, George. Do I have to form my question in the, in the form of an acronym? Um, <laughs> YES. CCB or YCY. Yeah, I, I know, point taken. Sorry. So, you, I know you've looked at several of these types of simulations over the years, um, and in the minutes few minutes leading up to tornado genesis, do you get the sense that there's like a sudden event that kind of triggers the whole process or is that it's just this kind of gradual evolution towards this state? Um, when I look at like your swaths that CM1 drops, I notice that the low level downdraft is intensifying several, you know, probably 10, 15 minutes before tornado genesis, maybe even 20 minutes before. So the low level updraft, like it, it, uh, I, I save swaths at like 500 meters or so, you're getting, you're getting vertical velocities of, you know, 40 meters per second, 500 meters above the ground, you know, ridiculous. It's, I'm, that's ballpark, I'm not sure. Yes, I've looked for this. The way I've, we sort of frame this is you see several things sort of happening at the same time. Is there an overarching forcing behind that? That's a great question, and we're looking for it. Because this, is, this stuff is all tied into itself, right? You know, you've got the, that the, um, all the things that we know that lead to you know, rotation at low levels and upper levels are happening. But it seems like, to me, it just seems like the updraft, for whatever reason, decides to get really strong. And when you put a really strong updraft around, over, on top of all this stuff, it just kicks off. Everything converges and just spins up. But no, I haven't identified any like, oh, this is when you know you see, like I've talked to Greg Tripoli about some things. Oh yeah, you see this thing happening over here in the overshooting top that comes down. Like, okay, I don't see that. But we're looking for things like that. I mean, we're looking for it, but we're not, we haven't found it yet. Um, I'll let you know. <laughs> 
No smoking gun. If there was, I would have definitely put it front and foremost. Jimmy and then Glenn. Uh, yeah, I guess it's related to that question. To, to what extent is this, would you call it uh, deterministic or based on the sounding? For example, if you changed your initial perturbation, would you... Yeah, do I, a lot of things have to come together to create a tornado. Well, let me say that I've run this same sounding at 100 meters, 50 meters, 30 meters, and 20 meters, and I get an EF5 in all four. So that is, suggests some robustness. Um, I've also run this same sounding and not gotten an EF5 tornado. Um, why did it, how, you might ask, how did that happen? Um, again, using slightly different initial conditions. Um, I, I'll save you my long sob story about how I almost lost the entire storm because I accidentally, when I initially ran this simulation, I had to add four kilometers into the ruck sounding to go up to 20 meters, 20 kilometers. And I, when I was basically in the, you're in the stratosphere, right? You're trying to make it isothermal. I accidentally made the lapse rates get a little bit smaller than they should be or larger than they should be aloft. And I had to redo the whole simulation because no, no way, in, even though it's probably not that important, it won't pass muster. So I went back to time equals zero, reran it. No. Oh no, my life is over. Um, it turns out that the simulation, the 30 meter simulation actually blew up and I had to restart with a smaller time step at one point. When I re, uh, I basically uh, reproduced the exact steps that I went the first time with the bad sounding, which wasn't really that bad, it came back. So yeah, initial conditions, I don't know. This is really one of the big predictability. When I look at some of the, the, the structure and, the, and especially the small scale structure in these storms, I hope we don't have to predict <laughs> at that resolution. It's just not realistic in our lifetimes. But um, no, that's, that's important. In fact, we might be able to get some good science out of doing much coarser resolution simulations, but a lot of them. Since at 50 meters, 100 meters, you still get a long track tornado. Um, so we're, yeah, those are, that's a good question. Hey Lee, um, I was just curious, you, you were talking before about how the SBC seemed to be completely detached from the tornado, yet if you looked at the, the surface vorticity features that were converging into the, the developing tornado, those were not um, detached from it, at least it didn't appear to be. So can you talk a bit more about the difference between, I guess, the surface merging yeah. features versus the, the right. broader current? Exactly. So when you see, you're talking like all about all these guys here, right? Uh, you had a better one that was rendered, I thought, but... but um, 3D stuff? Yeah, keep going back. Okay. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, probably here, right? No? Um, eh, it's hard to see the SVC in that, but sure. Oh, okay, so, yeah, I've got a lot of... These guys? These yeah. guys are good. Okay, sure. so like here, say. Yep, so you can see that the, the surface vorticity features that are, con that are converging with the tornado vortex are wrapped around the SVC at the top. I know. So they're not really detached. And so I guess I was wondering what you could say about that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's a good point. So these things are kind of, the, yeah, they're like, so here's the surface. Where, well, I'm saying you can see it happen. You can see now at the surface how these guys sort of get absorbed. These guys curve backwards and up and around. So you, your point is well taken. Where do these vortices end, first of all? And do they just kind of get you know absorbed into this SVC thing? The thing that I'm trying to say is that the the when you look at sort of the the, the helical structure of the SVC itself, which is the, the way we're defining it, is sort of behind these vortices. But you're right, they're sort of embedded as well. That seems to at upper levels be detached from the tornado, and that's the point we wanted to make. It isn't just being like a piece of the tornado. But you're right. There's there's questions here that need to be answered. Um, about this thing and whether you know, how all this comes together because we've seen these vortices before. I don't. And if Fujita identified an SVC 100 years ago before I knew about it, that's great because then I can. That's, well, not 100 years ago, but um, but we haven't. Again, we haven't looked at it enough to answer that question. And I, I know it's. But yeah, I'm just gonna find anything else. Well, this. Yeah. So this. Look at this. So this is during Genesis, right? So here is where you see. Where at least it looks to me like, you know, they're 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 separate things. But I don't know. I'm not afraid to say I don't know, and I really don't know. So, so where where are the particles that feed directly into the most intense vorticity? Where where are they coming from? Well, I, I'm nervous about doing backwards trajectories in such strong flow. So and that's how you normally forward. do that, right? So I'm yeah. only. I using... just look at the trajectories and going into the, the most intense. So this is during Genesis. I don't have any, um, or do you want me to show you during the most intense one? So that would be this over. Oh, any ones, just 
Yeah, we're, we're, we're... So I would say it's these guys. Is it the, the yellow ones? No, the green ones. Green ones. So these, you can see they're already starting to make the turn, right? They're, now, part of it's just to get a box here. These might be closer to the tornado, right? So I'm not... The ones that actually get into the high vorticity, the highest the, column well, of vorticity. I haven't looked at that, but you know what? If it's a two cell, it could be coming from way up here, right? Well, the ones in the middle, but the ones on the side going up have Right, to... right, right. We can't make that. I think it does show that the green... The green ones... ones uh, I think... I think yeah, yeah. That they're the ones, yeah. yeah, the green ones. And that, it's clearly from the cold side, and it's clearly near the ground. Okay. Um, that, that much I'm pretty, pretty confident in saying. Um, and it's, it's all on the cold side. You drop parcels out here, and they'll just, you know, they'll, they'll go up, but they end up being, where does the tornado begin? Where does the tornado cyclone begin? Where does the mesocyclone? You know, you got to define things. and. But that suggests it's over here in the, behind the forward flank, within the forward flank of the storm in the cold pool. Yep. Well, with that, um, you'll be here through tomorrow. All day tomorrow. All day tomorrow, maybe even for Rich's Dynamics Happy Hour, which I will I'll, advertise I'll, I'll be there. on the predictability of tornadoes, right? No. <laughs> no. Um, let's thank Lee once again.